Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a good amount of people here. Thank you for joining us this morning for our new report release. It's Achieving 100% Clean Electricity in the Southeast, Enacting a Federal Clean Electricity Standard. This is one of four webinars that we'll be hosting. Um, the first one is this one right now. It's on Duke Energy. Um, so if you haven't already read the report, we will be sending that out either tomorrow or Friday, in addition to a recording of all of the webinars, so you can look forward to that. But to get us started, I will talk a little bit about the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. In case you are new to our organization, we are a regional nonprofit focused in the Southeast. Um, we are an organization that promotes responsible and equitable energy choices to ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. As a leading force for energy policy in the region, SASA is focused on transforming the way we produce and consume energy in the Southeast. And this report is very much so focused on doing all of those things. To um, presenting today will be lead reporter, or excuse me, lead author of the report, Maggie Schober. She is the director of utility reform at Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Later on in the webinar, we will have a Q&A section where we'll be joined by other members of uh, SASA's utility team and they will be answering your questions. If you do have a question, please feel free to submit that using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. If you're with a publication, please denote that in the question that you are submitting. We will not be monitoring the chat, so please submit all of your questions using the Q&A box. So without further ado, Maggie can go ahead and get us started. Great, uh, thank you, Kate. Um, and as you can see on the current slide, just gonna give, you know, start with an overview of where we're headed today, um, which is, you know, just to start with some background, what are we talking about with this, you know, clean electricity standard term? What is that? Uh, why, why are we doing a report on this? Uh, we're gonna go a little bit into our method and assumptions. You know, there's a lot of details on that in the appendix um, and we welcome questions on those. Uh, so that'll be pretty high level. Uh, and then we're gonna give you, you know, a snapshot of the results, what we found interesting, um, you know, what some of the takeaways were um, and move on to next steps. And then uh, we're gonna save a lot of time for Q&A at the end, as Kate mentioned, you know, put those in the, the Q&A box. Uh, you can see on this map um, the territories covered by the four utility companies uh, that we covered in this report. Um, so some of those companies operate more than one utility. Uh, one example is Duke Energy, which we're talking about today, um, which uh, you can see in the sort of tealish, um, you know, light teal color. Uh, here on the map, uh, they have territory, uh, Duke Energy has territory in both North and South Carolina, as well as in Florida. Um, I will note uh, that for Duke Energy, they have utilities elsewhere in other states, uh, but since this is, you know, these are the states that we focused on in the Southeast, uh, these are the states that we included our analysis. So we didn't look at uh, Duke's um, operations in Ohio, Kentucky, or Indiana. All right, uh, so starting at that high level, what is a clean electricity standard? Uh, so a CES, as we call them, um, is a policy that basically says you have to get a certain percentage of your energy from a certain set of resources by a certain date. So are there are three main ele elements there. What resources qualify? Um, is it clean? Is it renewable? You know, some of these terms are used generally, uh, but usually there's a you know list of specific uh, types of resources that qualify. Uh, what percentage needs to be either clean or renewable, and then what is that target date? Um, it, it's important to note when we talk about these policies, this is not a new kind of policy. Um, this. These are policies, uh, you know, a lot of times we call them renewable portfolio standards um, and more than 30 states, territories, DC uh, have these kinds of policies in place. Um, and actually a lot of utilities and states have experience with them. The first one uh, was actually in Iowa in the early 80s. Um, it's also important to note since we're talking about Duke today, 
uh, North Carolina does have an RPS. So, you know, Duke itself um, has some experience. Uh, in, in North Carolina, it's called the REPS policy, REPS. Um, you'll hear it, it uh, termed, but it's the same kind of policy. Uh, so what we are looking at is what if one of these kinds of policies were to be in place at the federal level? Um, and you can see on the slide, there have been a number of um, you know, recent proposals, uh, current proposals, uh, both by the Biden administration, um, that's 80% clean by 2030 and 100% clean by 2035. Um, and then you can see on the, uh, on the list that there are um, you know, a few other proposals by various members of Congress, either in this uh, Congress or the previous Congress. Um, and they vary by you know, what resources qualify, uh, what percentages, um, and what dates, uh, but the, the concept uh, behind uh, the policy structure is, is generally um, you know, similar across all of these. All right, so why, why are we looking at this right now? Um, I mean, so the first is you know, from the previous slide, you can see uh, there have been a number of policies proposed um, you know, this, we haven't seen this, this kind of interest uh, in a policy like this at the federal level uh, for over 10 years now. Um, and so it is important that we look at it. Um, it's also, you know, a policy that would have an outsized impact here in the Southeast uh, for two main reasons. Uh, the first, um, as I mentioned earlier, North Carolina has a state policy, uh, but they're the only state um, in the Southeast that has this kind of a, uh, you know, mandate uh, in place. Um, and the second is that uh, we don't have an RTO or a market um, in, in our region. Uh, and so because, you know, utilities are vertically integrated, um, these policies that are, you know, more of a, a standard policy uh, have, have a greater impact um, rather than uh, you know, markets where uh, clean resources are lower cost and thus are, you know, better able to uh, compete um, with uh, both existing and new uh, fossil resources. So that's generally what we were going for with this report, uh, you know, why we were looking at this right now. Um, this, this analysis that we did for Duke um, and the other utilities is so that we can visualize what would it look like for these utilities in the Southeast to you know, meet a target of 100% clean electricity. Um, you know, is, it, is it even feasible by 2035? Uh, or do we have different options? Um, you know, what does that look like? Uh, and really, you know, this report is designed to start a conversation uh, so that once we can visualize it, we can talk about, you know, what are the different options that we would, you know, like to include or maybe not include, um, you know, one of the, what are the dates we're looking at. Um, and this, this conversation is among, as I put here, um, you know, lots of key folks, customers, policymakers, regulators, and utilities. I think it's really important at the outset to also say what this analysis and this report is not. Uh, so what we did not do is least cost optimization. That is a process that is um, often used by utilities, um, particularly for resource planning. Uh, it is a resource intensive process. Um, it does take some time. Uh, and you know it, it's, it was not something that we were um, you know, interested in doing at this point. Uh, as I said, you know, we're just trying to get a snapshot of what this would look like and start a conversation. Uh, we also did not look at um, transmission or power flow analysis. We looked at transmission at a very high level uh, and we looked at each utility, operating utility um, alone, kind of as an island. So we're, they're not trading resources um, and we're not looking at, you know, how power flows uh, within a utility service territory either. Um, and the last thing is what well, this is not, you know, you'll see some figures here um, on, you know, megawatts or megawatt hours from different resources. This is not um, the maximum uh, amount of, um, of these resources uh, that we think can be achieved. All 
All right. Um, so we do have a fairly lengthy appendix in um, the report itself, uh, which shows um, you know, more about our methodology, uh, more details around, you know, assumptions and, and all that. I encourage you, um, you know, if you're interested in any of this, please, you know, dive in, um, you know, ask us your questions about uh, that methodology. Um, you know, we tried to make it as transparent as we, as we could on this um, and, and, uh, and wanted to, you know, have that conversation around what are, what are reasonable assumptions. Um, you can see the first thing when we're, you know, doing this kind of analysis that we look at is, well, what's the target? Uh, so we looked at what uh, the Biden administration has proposed that 100% clean by 2035. We just did a snapshot of that one year. We didn't do, you know, all the years leading up to it. Um, so we're just looking at 2035. Um, and when we talk about clean resources, uh, for you know most of our cases, we included. Uh, wind, solar, energy efficiency, and demand response, you know, all demand side resources there, um, existing nuclear, existing hydro, and existing biomass. Um, we did not include any uh, fossil gas, um, even with CCS, we just didn't put that as an option um, in there, or um, hydrogen, or anything like that. We do uh, talk about those um, a little bit more in the report, um, and I can answer questions on it, uh, but generally, we wanted to start with um, what are you know options that are available, commercially available, and cost effective today, uh, and can we reach that 2035 target uh, using those options that are available today? Um, so our basic method was start with what the load res load and um, resource plan is for Duke in 2035. So what do they you know how much do they need in terms of megawatts and megawatt hours? We took out all the fossil resources, that's coal and gas, um, any oil, anything like that. Uh, first, we applied distributed resources, that's your energy efficiency, demand response, and solar, uh, distributed solar. Um, then we applied wind resources, just because those tend to be you know, a little bit constrained based on um, the wind resource, both within the Southeast um, transmission to get you know, wind from Western states into the Southeast, um, and also, uh, you know, what we thought would be a, um, you know, ambitious but still achievable um, assumption on how much offshore wind can be built again by 2035. Um, any remaining gaps in there, we, uh, on a megawatt hour basis, we filled then with um, large scale solar. Um, and, then, uh, and then we took a look at reserve margins and added additional you know, solar storage, a little bit of what we called other renewable in there. Um, and then the final check uh, that we did to make sure uh, that these pathways can meet load is we tested them against a peak day. Uh, so we looked at the hourly load um, for a peak day in both winter and summer uh, for each of the operating utilities and adjusted the need for um, you know, large scale solar storage um, resources uh, under those conditions. Again, I probably already went into more detail than I planned to on the methodology, but um, anything more on that is, is also in the appendix and I can answer questions. Um, so we did look at two main pathways. Uh, I will be honest, we kind of struggled with what to name these. Uh, so the first one, it was pretty clear, this one is gonna be a distributed energy resource focused pathway. This is one where energy efficiency and distributed resources meet about a third of energy needs by 2035. So this is a case where we think, again, this is a, an ambitious, but very much doable um, assumption uh, that assumes that not only um, is the utility focusing on these you know, distributed and customer oriented solutions, uh, but they're doing so um, for a, over a sustained um, time frame, so that's you know we start ramping these programs up um, today, tomorrow, um, and we continue to uh, invest in them through 2035. Uh, and and these resources, energy efficiency, distributed solar, they are you know shown to not only help reduce um, emissions, but also very much key. They help reduce customer bills. 
um, and the overall cost of uh, the to the utility, which then brings everybody's costs down. Um, I will also note that we did um, include demand response um, that was used uh, on the peak days um, in this pathway that I'm still talking about the one on the left. Um, but this pathway did still use, you know, a fair amount of um, energy storage, uh, wind and large scale um, solar. So that was kind of our first case that we looked at. Um, and then we wanted to do a second pathway uh, that looked at, well, what if the utility does not meet um, this level of distributed uh, energy resource um, penetration? And this is important that the DERs or distributed energy resources in this pathway are still much higher uh, than what we see in most or in all of the utilities plans as they stand right now. Um, but it's, it's just not quite as high as, um, you're not quite as much as in the, the DER focused pathway. Um, and so to balance that out, there is more of that large scale solar wind um, and typically more storage that we saw in that, we call it the large scale renewable focus pathway um, because it's just a little bit more, you know, the balance between the distributed resources and the large resources, um, you know, is a little bit shifted more towards those large uh, scale resources. So before I get into any of the results, uh, there were two main things that we took away from this analysis that I think are super important um, that everybody takes away from this webinar. The first is that um, a variety of clean resources is needed. So that's you know, both solar and wind, both distributed and large scale, um, you know, storage and energy efficiency. Uh, you know, the, the portfolios just make a lot of sense if you focus on all of those rather than just say, we're just gonna build a bunch of solar <laughs> or we're just gonna build a bunch of wind. Um, that just doesn't get you there, um, you know, as, as well or as cleanly. Uh, it's also important that we start immediately. Um, a lot of these programs, the distributor programs, they do, you know, take a while to sort of ramp up. Um, we can think about it by thinking about a basic energy efficiency program where you're doing a, um, you know, replacement of an HVAC or a, an AC, something like that. Um, not everybody replaces their AC or their HVAC in every single year. So in order to capture people, you wanna start you know, this year, capture folks that are replacing it this year and next year and et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how um, you know, the longer you have a program like that going, uh, the, more, um, uh, the more savings you get overall. Um, and if someone is you know, installing um, a new HVAC in 2030, uh, hopefully that is still um, operating uh, in 2035 um, and, and you still get those savings. So uh, that's one example of why it's important to start immediately. Um, the other one is on the, the large scale renewables. Um, you know, this is a lot of, you know, solar and storage needed built out um, and projects like offshore wind, you know, take a while. Um, Governor Cooper in, in North Carolina has announced um, offshore wind um, targets, and those are actually fairly in line with our analysis that we'd already done when he announced that. So we were, we were um, pleasantly surprised that there's some, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, some good, um, we're, we're kind of on the same page there. Uh, but, you know, those, those projects obviously will take a while to um, permit, get going, and, and get operational. Uh, and to have them, you know, kind of already operating by 2035 is absolutely doable, uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to be, you know, super easy to do. All right, so uh, let's uh, get into some of these results. Uh, first, looking at the distributed energy resource pathway, um, there is, you can see on the left, uh, the three bars on the left show the current uh, Duke Utilities plans. Um, and the three bars on the right show uh, what those, what, and, and again, this is a snapshot of 2035. Um, I'll also note that this is capacity. Uh, this is not energy needs. Um, so we're talking about megawatts, not megawatt hours. Uh, so you can see the percent of capacity shifts quite a bit, um, a lot more solar, uh, but there's also 
uh, wind storage, um, that green at the bottom is uh, energy efficiency and demand response um, together uh, and, and that there is a, a big shift there. Um, as I said, uh, between energy efficiency and distributed solar um, meets about a third of the energy needs uh, for each utility that varies a little bit between, um, between the three uh, operating utilities um, and that the, the main resource uh, for the remainder of the energy needs is uh, that large scale solar um, in, in all three of those, but uh, particularly in uh, Duke Energy, Florida, which that's, I guess I should have said this at the beginning, the, the, three, the three operating utilities from left to right, DEP is Duke Energy Progress, uh, DEC is Duke Energy Carolinas, and both of those utility, utilities operate in both North and South Carolina. Um, and then DEF is Duke Energy Florida, which um, as the name implies, operates in Florida. So I'm gonna breeze through some of these uh, just to show you um, kind of what that uh, peak day would look like uh, for each of the three utilities. Um, this is Duke Energy Progress on a winter peak day. Uh, so you can see um, that the, uh, the gray here is storage, um, and that helps in both you know, morning and uh, nighttime. Uh, this dotted line is what the uh, load shape, uh, the demand for energy would look like without storing any, uh, or without charging any of that storage. Um, so you can see that it, it changes, uh, but that uh, all of the storage is charged within that same 24 hours. Uh, so that means the area under the gray curve is equal to the area um, the difference between the, the dotted line and the, um, the solid line up here at the top. Uh, so during the day, uh, that solar, I mean, that storage is charged mostly with solar. Um, you can see the contribution of the light yellow is the distributed solar, and then the dark yellow is the, the utility scale or large scale solar. Um, so those are charging, uh, charging up your storage, um, as well as the, the different purples are the different kinds of wind. Um, you can see at the bottom, uh, energy efficiency is kind of your, your basic base load here, um, but some of the other resources contribute as well. Uh, so here's a summer peak day. Uh, this one is Duke Energy Florida. Um, and from here, uh, you can see that uh, storage is still used in a similar capacity. Um, you can see that there is some of that uh, sort of transparent-ish gray at the top, um, on top of the, uh, you know, the peak, that's actually excess generation. So even in the summertime, um, there is some sort of extra megawatt hours uh, that is for, you know, for different uses, um, whether uh, there can be load shifted to, to certain times or um, it can be used for things like generating uh, hydrogen, uh, all sorts of different um, possibilities there. Um, all right, and, and with that excess generation, I think it's important to note that even on a summer peak day, um, there would be uh, some curtailment of resources as well. So for here, example, um, uh, you can see that the biomass waste and other renewable category, that kind of light green um, is not uh, generating during that uh, middle of the day timeframe. And then we also wanted to look at, well, what happens in a typical spring day? Uh, we can also you know, use these results to think about what happens in the fall. Uh, these are the seasons when people generally use less electricity and so, um, and the load shapes tend to be a lot flatter. Uh, that means there isn't as much change between you know, the lowest <laughs> amount of load and the highest amount of load in any hour of the day. Uh, so from here, um, you can see uh, that it looks Kind of different. It's, I mean, it's the same uh, resources, but uh, you know, there's there's more of that excess generation. One thing that's really um, important to note about uh, our analysis here is that um, for all of the the Duke um, utilities that do have existing nuclear that we included, uh, you can see there's no red here. Uh, but Duke Energy Carolinas does have existing nuclear, um, so uh, that means that you know we found if if you're building enough. Uh, renewables to meet the peak days during you know summer and winter time there's actually enough resources on the grid 
just within each of these operating utilities um, to be able to mothball or turn off uh, those nuclear plants uh, for you know spring and fall. Um, and so you can use that for maintenance. Um, you can use that time uh, basically to you know to do anything you need to do at the nuclear plant, um, and you're saving you know money on not having to spend it on nuclear fuel. Um, and, and all of that. So uh, we thought that was an, an interesting finding um, as well. So I'll talk uh, just briefly about this, um, this other pathway uh, that we looked at, um, which we called the large scale renewal pathway. Um, you can see up at the top uh, that distributed resources still meet about 20% um, of total energy needs. Again, that's distributed solar and energy efficiency, uh, but that there was a, a greater, you know, a higher level of investments in uh, these large uh, renewable projects. So that's offshore wind, um, onshore wind for Carolinas. Uh, we actually even included a small bit of onshore wind in Florida in this case, um, and then also uh, more of large scale solar compared to the, um, the DER's case. All right, so just really briefly, um, I know I said we, we focused on these two main pathways. We did wanna kind of test out some other um, options. Uh, and these are some, you know, some of the high level results from, results from those um, you know, sort of tests that we ran. The first is, well, what happens if um, we leave some gas on just for the reserve margins? Uh, we looked at this because as we were um, putting together these pathways, we realized that the amount of storage that was needed to meet the reserve margins um, was more than was needed um, to meet even those peak days in winter and summertime. Um, and you know, storage is while the costs are coming down. Uh, we weren't sure if it is. You know, uh, we wanted to look at the option of well, what if uh, we leave some of these gas plants? We don't turn them on at all, but they're just there sort of in case of emergencies. Um, you know, they're there to meet those reserve margin targets, um, which I should explain what a reserve margin in is, what a reserve margin is in case folks are wondering. So if, um, if your utility with a, you know, 100 megawatt peak say, and you have a 15% reserve margin, um, you would need to have 115 megawatts online to meet that reserve margin target. That's you know a real kind of basic look at, at reserve margins. Uh, one thing, so, so what we found under this case is uh, that um, if, uh, if we do sort of leave some of these um, gas CTs, combustion turbines uh, online but not operating, uh, then we would need about 3.8 gigawatts less storage, that's between all three of the Duke utilities um, to meet the reserve margin um, and still meet uh, load during every hour of the, the peak days. Uh, this is similar to you know, some of the analysis that other 100% um, you know, clean energy uh, studies have looked at. Um, and so uh, you know, our findings are kind of reflective of, of what others have found there as well. Uh, we also wanted to look and see, well, what happens if there's no offshore wind? Um, that, was, uh, that was something that changed the results for all three of the Duke utilities we looked at. Um, and as, as we expected, uh, they, the utilities would build uh, more solar um, and some of the other renewables um, that could also look like more solar and storage. Um, but you need something if you're not something else if you're not building offshore wind. Um, and then the last one we looked at um, is what if the existing nuclear plants um, that currently have licenses that expire before 2035, um, you know, what if those licenses are not extended? And so those units uh, retire, you know, when their current uh, license expires. Um, so that impacted only the utilities in the Carolinas, uh, both DEC and DEP. Um, it was about 3.7 gigawatts total of capacity at three different plants, um, you can see on the slide. Uh, and what we found is that there would be, you know, a, a lot of additional solar, sort of this other renewable category 
um, and some additional storage as well uh, needed if those if those nuclear plants um, if their licenses were not extended. All right, so what do we what did we learn from all this? Where do we go from here? Um, well, first off, uh, I mean, the super obvious one was that this is possible. There are different ways we can we can get there um, to 100% clean electricity. Um, and there are also things that make uh, this these pathways easier. Uh, even though we only looked at, you know, each utility individually um, and at existing technologies, uh, it's pretty clear from this analysis that there are two things that would make um, you know, reaching 100% uh, clean electricity easier in the Southeast. Uh, the first one of those is some sort of market construct um, where uh, utilities are able to share reserves. Uh, so that case where we looked at um, you know, leaving the, the gas CTs online but not operating in order to just meet reserve margins. Uh, well, what if you know, utilities are able to share resources to meet these reserve margin needs? Um, and also some, some previous states analysis has showed uh, most of our utilities in the Southeast are not peaking around the same time. Um, and so if we can sort of pool our resources together um, and, and then not need to build as, much, uh, as many new resources overall, uh, that obviously makes you know, this pathway to 100% clean easier um, and, and lowers uh, any costs associated with it. Uh, the second one is also really key, um, which is uh, even though we looked at the technologies that do exist today, uh, we know that there is innovation going on um, and you know, we think that should continue. Uh, and that as you know, new resources and improvements to existing resources um, become commercialized, you know, that that would make it easier for, uh, for these um, pathways. So one example for that is uh, long-term storage, whereas we assumed that all the storage um, would be charged within that same 24 hours uh, of when it needs to be discharged. If you have long-term storage, you can use some of that excess generation in the spring and the fall, um, and then, you know, charge up your storage for winter and summertime peaks. Uh, you really uh, can get by with um, less storage overall. Uh, so the way we see this, it's not you know an either or, either deployment or R and D uh, that we really you know need to be doing both. Um, we also found uh, something that um, you know maybe we expected, but not a big surprise. But um, one of the key findings is that we. We aren't at risk of um, investing too quickly or too much in these clean resources, especially energy efficiency and distributed solar. Uh, so it's it's not, you know, it's not. Oh no, we did too much. Um, there is a lot to be done. So the sooner we can start and the more we can do, uh, the better off we will be in the long term. Um, the last piece is something we didn't cover directly here. Uh, but something that um, is, is pretty critical is that electrification really goes hand in hand with this uh, clean electricity target. Um, and that, uh, you know, as you electrify uh, different sectors um, and are, you know, using cleaner electricity, uh, you can reduce emissions not only from the electricity standard, I mean, the, the electricity sector, which was the focus here, uh, but also from those sectors that you are electrifying, like transportation, like buildings, uh, like some industrial uh, practices, those sorts of things. Um, so the last thing is uh, more analysis is needed on this. Um, as we said on the outset, this is you know high level conversation starter, um, but you know we'll be continuing to look at things. Um, and really key is that uh, you know every utility um, does some sort of resource planning process. Um, whether that's annual or, or not, um, but looking at getting to 100% clean, um, like we did here, should be a part of every utility's resource plan uh, moving forward. Um, so those were our conclusions. Next steps. I mean, before you know, we can quite get, uh, get there, we, we do need a federal um, electricity standard to become law. Uh, that's sort of 
the next step here. And also once we know what that looks like, um, we can see you know, more about, well, you know, what is the target? Is it 80% by 2030? Is it 100% by 2035? What counts as clean? Um, and, and how do we get there? Um, all right. So with that, I think we will turn it over uh, to Q&A. Um, here's our, our contact information on the screen in case you want to reach out to, that's myself at the top, um, and uh, our team of authors uh, there on the slide. Awesome. Thanks, Maggie, for the presentation. And thanks to everyone who has submitted a question so far. We did get a question um, asking if this was going to be recorded. And yes, this is being recorded, as are the other three webinars associated with this report and those will be sent out on Thursday. So look out for that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the Q&A here. And this is a question from an audience participant. I'm fascinated by the idea of a known nuclear relicensing model. Do you use new virtual power plants in your demand response mockups? Duke's territory is growing at such a clip I'm hoping we can talk to developers about partnering with Duke to try VPPs. In the Southeast, energy efficiency efforts sometimes bump up against unsafe or unfit housing, which must be addressed first. Could a VPP offer an alternative for both housing and peak shaving? And I think um, Maggie will start off answering that and then we'll kick it over to Forrest, who's also joining us as well as Brian and Heather Forrest is CESA's Energy Efficiency Program Director. All right, um, a good question, great question. Kind of wanna um, unpack it because there's a, a couple of different pieces here. Um, so we didn't assume anything different uh, on demand response or energy efficiency when we looked at uh, whether or not the nuclear um, units would be uh, you know, would be relicensed or not, I guess is the right term. Um, what, we, what we did do is uh, basically, you know, trade that for other large scale resources, but absolutely um, something that could be done is, um, you know, trade that for more distributed resources. Um, and that could include uh, energy efficiency and demand response when we looked at you know what we were looking at for both energy efficiency and demand response we were looking at a pretty high level um and so we didn't you know we didn't say yes there's virtual power plants no there's not um it's it's sort of a um uh, uh cumulative um um uh just um example of what could be <laughs> Uh, you know, what impact uh, different kinds of demand response could be. It, it is also kind of at the, what we would call portfolio level. Um, so while we look at, okay, we have this many megawatts of demand response, that would look like, you know, a number of different programs for, you know, residential, commercial, industrial, different kinds of customers and different kinds of programs. So I'll let Forrest uh, chime in and, and add anything else on that. Yeah, and I really think that covered the, the big question behind it, which is to what extent can energy efficiency and demand response offset the need for power plants, uh, including nuclear? And I think Maggie said it right, that um, you know, we, we have a, uh, an amount of energy efficiency in there that uh, could be produced through a variety of different strategies. It's a portfolio um, that, that could be uh, filled in with any number of different program um, approaches. Um, but, but ultimately, what we have put in uh, is similar to how Maggie described uh, the renewable energy resources. It is an aggressive approach, but not impossible. Um, so we you know, are not conceptualizing the amount of energy efficiency that, that you saw in the graphs earlier as, as a maximum. Um, so there definitely is you know, potential to, to ramp energy efficiency and demand response up uh, and offset other um, you know, existing resources or, uh, or, or even offset you know, renewable uh, and, and storage resources. Um, the one other detail that, that was touched on in that question had to do with um, homes that may need repairs. And, and I think that that's, you know, is an important consideration when it comes to deployment of programs, uh, especially when you put considerations of equity um, into this. So that, you know, homes uh, of 
households that have limited financial means, you know, may have uh, deferred maintenance, may have um, some additional challenges to doing energy efficiency. Uh, and, you know, I think our hope would be that the investment in clean energy um, is uh, aligned with and, and um, leverages, um, you know, non-energy investment dollars uh, as well. But uh, anyway, it's a great question. <laughs> did we miss anything, Kate, or did we kind of touch it all? I think you guys covered everything. Okay, so this next question is for Maggie. Do Duke's current resource plans project all the way out to 2035? Do they include some wiggle room for later years, for example, 2025 to 20, 2035, to allow for more aggressive decarbonization? Yep, uh, so we are actually in the middle-ish, um, maybe towards the end of a cycle of uh, Duke's um, Integrated Resource Plan or IRP process right now. Uh, they submitted their um, IRPs September 1st, 2020, um, and they're still not uh, finalized or approved by um, PSCs in either North or South Carolina. Um, th th this is the, the DEC and DEP um, utilities. Uh, Duke Energy Florida, um, in Florida, they have a different setup uh, for resource planning. Uh, where um, instead of having a you know process with the the PSC uh, with interveners and whatnot, um, every April first, uh, each um, each of the the major utilities in Florida submits. They're called ten year site plans, uh, but it's essentially the results of their IRP um, process and says, okay, the this is this is our load over the next ten years. These are you know the the energy efficiency we're going to do. This is the these are the power plants we're going to build um, at a real high level. So um, the the Duke Energy Florida one's pretty easy. Where we took that ten year site plan, and obviously it only goes out ten years. We were looking um, farther than that, um, and we we projected out uh, based on what's in their ten year site plan from um, this past April. Uh, in the Duke um, IRPs in the Carolinas, uh, both DEP and DEC, uh, they actually had, I think it was six um, different uh, portfolios that they presented in those IRPs. Um, so we did have to pick one. Uh, we picked uh, what appears to be their sort of quote unquote base case, uh, which is base case with a carbon policy um, case. And that's what we used. Um, that's what we started from. Uh, when we looked at, you know, a snapshot of just 2035. Okay. And actually, can I say one more thing on these, which is that, um, <laughs> you know, this IRP process uh, for the Carolinas, um, for DEP and DEC is something that does, uh, they do update these um, well, they, they technically update them every year, but they do a sort of more major redo um, every two years. Um, and that, uh, you know, that process is, um, you know, basically that is to say the, the IRP that was presented in 2020 um, might look different from what they would present in 2022, might look different from what they would present in 2024, uh, those kinds of things. Um, but, Again, the key um, to you know reaching this goal of getting to 100% clean power is we got to start right away. Uh, so that you know what what is Duke doing in the next five years is absolutely critical. And if they're not planning to you know get to 100% clean energy, they're not planning to retire coal and gas um, plants. In fact, they're actually planning to build new gas. I mean, that's just going to make, uh, you know, reaching these 100% um, clean electricity goals so much harder to do. Okay, and this is a little bit um, extending on that answer, and you may have covered it in your previous answer. Based on your analysis, can you comment on whether Duke or North Carolina may have an easier time meeting a 100% federal clean electricity standard? given the state has a 12.5% REPS already in the books. Sorry if that's reps and I'm saying REPS. <laughs> reps or REPS, I've heard it. I've heard it both ways. Right. Um, but yeah, so uh, I 
do think that there is probably a little bit of advantage that, uh, you know, Duke has some experience with this. Um, and, and they have experience in, in, um, in some of their other states as well. Uh, I mean, just basically they have the, the internal infrastructure at the utility to track, okay, you know, this megawatt hour is a renewable megawatt hour and, and we need to keep track of those to show that we have compliance. Um, I think also um, between the reps um, and uh, PERPA uh, and some of the energy efficiency programs um, for Duke and the Carolinas, uh, that the, the, the difference between, you know, what they, um, where they are now um, and where they need to get to is, um, it's not as big as we've seen in some other Southeast utilities. I wanna be really careful when I say this, it still needs, you know, they still need to have a big change, particularly around um, their plans to build new gas uh, infrastructure, you just can't get to 100% clean electricity um, in less than 15 years if you're planning to build new gas plants. Okay, let's switch it over to reserve margins. Duke has been criticized for overstating its reserve margin needs. Did you establish or did we establish our own targets for reserve margins or a lower one? This is relevant, especially to slide 13. Uh, yes, so we, um, we, we, Duke has been criticized for reserve margins, absolutely. Um, I, <laughs> we at SACE have been uh, one of those critics um, and we do think that there are issues uh, with both Duke and, and some other utilities saying, hey, uh, you know, we need these really re high reserve margins. Um, and when we dig into the methodology, we just don't agree with either how they've done it, what they've assumed, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so rather than base our analysis on what uh, the utilities were saying that their reserve margin needs were, we used um, an independent source. Uh, it's called NERC. Um, which is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And they are the ones that set, as, as the name implies, they set the reliability standards. Um, and so they have, uh, you know, for, for each region, uh, they have developed a 15% reserve margin target. Um, and so we used that for our analysis. Okay, and one more question on reserve margins. You mentioned that the reserve margin is driving a lot of capacity need relative to peak demand. Would most of the model battery storage be for meeting reserve margins rather than actual load? So um, that is where uh, that, that scenario we did where we left some gas on, on the system but not operating uh, was really key because that showed us, okay, what, what storage is there to be used to meet peak needs and what storage is there just for reserve margins. Um, and we saw over eight gigawatts less of, um, you know, of storage needed for reserve margins. Overall, looking at the whole Southeast, I can't remember what the percentage was for Duke, for Duke's three um, utilities, but overall for the, the Southeast, it was about a 15% um, decline in the amount of storage that would be needed. Uh, so that tells us, okay, if we're just using storage, 15% of it is to meet reserve margins only. And then, you know, that remaining 85% is contributes to the reserve margin needs, but also is used to meet those uh, peak, peak load days. Now, that doesn't mean that 85% is used in all of the days. Um, it could actually just be used in a few days of the year. Uh, and so, you know, but, but that was where we looked at, um, you know, does, is the storage needed uh, for either a summer or winter peak day. Okay, and let's talk about solar. So maybe Brian, who is SESA's solar program director can answer this question. And he's actually, we're in the process of working on our fourth annual Solar in the Southeast report, which is forthcoming. So it's a great compliment to this report. Um, the question is, did I see correctly that local solar and local wind appear to be complementary as far as when they are generating? Okay. Um, can you hear me now? 
Yes. I hope. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, that that's a good question. And honestly, I, I, I think it's um, very generally it is true. So it sun obviously shines more during the day and more on peak summer days than in winter. Uh, wind tends to blow more uh, at night and in winter months. So, so there is a complementarity in a general sense. When Maggie talked about how we did this exercise, um, we, we, we talked about making sure that the uh, energy needs were being met both on a, uh, a winter peak day, a summer peak day, and then also assessed on a shoulder month day, which tends to be a, a low load to, to understand how we were handling the excess power that might be generated from those uh, intermittent resources. And, and for example, we have an hourly generation profile for different resource types. Um, I'm most familiar with the solar ones because we, we purchased those from Clean Power Research. They're solar anywhere. Uh, modeling process, and we've got uh, well multiple different technologies across uh, almost 150 different sites across the southeast, and we assemble portfolios for each of the utilities, um, and we're able to to have a, a generation profile for each hour of the year, um, and match that up against the the historic uh, load and project load profiles of the utilities to make sure that we had adequate resources in each of the hours. And then I think back to the question, it does um, validate the statement that uh, uh, solar and wind resources tend to be complementary, both uh, time of day and day of year. Okay, thank you. And I have another question for you. Would utilities most likely need to retain renewable energy credits of customer owned solar systems to get to 100% clean energy by 2035? Um, that's another great question. I'm not sure why my video is not showing up, by the way. Uh, so, I can see you. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to uh, touch on that a little bit next week when we release the solar report, because one of the things that we're observing lately is as, as companies are doing these uh, solar deals, um, virtual PPAs, sleeved PPAs, green tariffs, however they're, they're marketed in, in the different geographies, um, the, the RECs necessarily transfer to those contractual off takers because that's, that's what they want is to be able to make the claim and only whoever owns the RECs at the end of the transaction is the one that can make the claim. So we're starting to uh, think that there needs to be a little more um, like transparency in that process to make sure that the accounting is done right and that there's not any uh, double counting of, of those electrons. Um, and so it, to, to the question of whether the utilities would need to own the RECs at the end of the day to retire them against a clean electricity standard, that really is one of the details that has to be worked out to make sure that uh, you know how the accounting is going to be done in a transparent and accountable way. Okay, thank you. And everyone look forward to that report that's coming out next week. We've been very busy at SACE. Um, so we're gonna kick it over to a question about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are set to increase exponentially. Does this report factor in the need for this additional electricity load and or needs? Um, yeah, I can, I can handle that one. So the, this would be a pretty quick answer, which is the first, um, does this account for that level of, um, you know, transportation electrification? Uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, we used the utility load uh, forecasts, and those do, you know, assume some level of, you know, electrification of different sectors, um, but, uh, you know, not necessarily um, 
you know, the same level that we would like to explore, uh, where we would see, you know, very high penetration of uh, electrification in both the transportation and other sectors. Um, and, you know, a lot of those policies have actually been, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the, you know, policies that contain a clean electricity standard um, also include provisions uh, such as, you know, ways to encourage um, electric vehicles um, and other kinds of, you know, electric uh, buses, electric school buses, um, and other kinds of uh, transportation of electrification electrification of transportation. Um, so that is definitely something we call in the report as a need for, you know, additional analysis um, and, and uh, something also we think uh, should be included in a utility resource planning process. Okay, thank you. And we'll wrap with one more question on Duke Energy and then do some more high level questions just about a clean electricity standard before we close out. Just a reminder, this is being recorded, so everyone will get a copy of this. And if you have any questions that didn't get answered, you can feel free to follow up with us after um, the webinar. So what are the biggest takeaways for what Duke Energy needs to do that might differentiate it from other utility systems analyzed in the report? Yep, uh, so the... Um, the results from, from Duke Energy, first off, it, it depends on, you know, which operating utility you're talking about. Uh, there were a little bit of, you know, different needs uh, for the different operating utilities. Uh, so I'll start in Florida and, and move up. Uh, so Florida, um, we didn't uh, include any onshore wind as a sort of possibility in our main case in Florida. Um, and so, we, we did include uh, both um, offshore wind and uh, wind from, you know, Western states that gets, um, you know, brought to the state of Florida through transportation, typically through, um, you know, through Mississippi or Alabama, Georgia, that becomes that uh, direction down. Uh, so some things that are needed for those projects, for those larger projects, obviously, uh, got to look at offshore wind that doesn't have to be in Florida. It could be, you know, projects in South Carolina, for instance, that are then connected through trans transmission to Florida. Um, and then also the, the transmission, you know, just improving um, the transmission lines uh, between the transmission connections between Florida and um, say Oklahoma, uh, because there's, uh, you know, quite a bit of distance there. Uh, the two are connected technically, you know, electrons can get from one place to the other even today, but we need to sort of ramp up that transmission. We also need to make it cost effective right now. Um, the, way it, the way it's set up for each utility that that electron would have to go through, um, that utility charges, you know, a price to, to get through um, to allow that to, to move over the system. Uh, so having a way for um, you know, more fluid flows would be uh, beneficial both to Florida and, and Duke and the Carolinas uh, because they're in sort of the Eastern and Southern parts of the Southeast, uh, that transmission piece is, is, um, is uh, even more critical uh, for them because they obviously have to go through more utilities. Um, and then I think that the, you know, the key, this is not unique to Duke, um, but it is absolutely important, which is, you know, start immediately and really focus on those uh, distributed um, resources, uh, the energy efficiency um, and, you know, the distributed solar are, are absolutely critical. Um, and especially in Florida where, um, you know, Duke's of Duke's three utilities, uh, Duke Energy Florida is lagging uh, the other two in its existing energy efficiency and, you know, all three of them need to uh, ramp those up. Okay, and we'll do one last question. Why do we need a clean electricity standard as opposed to going through regulatory processes that are already in place? Okay, um, <laughs> so this one I could I could do a whole other presentation on <laughs> probably, but I will try and do it very quickly because we're we're out of time. Uh, so one is that um, the regulatory construct is really not in place to encourage utilities to do uh, to do this on their own. Um, and and the second is that uh, it's pretty clear from the current utility plans, they're not 
planning to, they're not striving to do this on their own, um, you know, regardless of, you know, what the, the regulatory construct is. So, you know, put those two together, um, we really don't have the tools. Could it, could it be possible that, um, you know, a utility could put together an IRP that gets to 100% clean by 2035, a PSC, a, a commission could approve it? Absolutely, that is possible. Um, although from, from our experience um, engaging on these, you know, it's highly unlikely. Uh, and so a clean electricity standard from the federal level really uh, kind of, you know, pushes the utilities to need to do that. Um, and then however they meet that clean electricity standard uh, is up to them. All right, thank you so much, Maggie. And for everyone else on the panel who answered questions and thanks to everyone for attending today's webinar. We have three more, um, so be sure to sign up and learn more about what the other major utility systems in the Southeast can do when it comes to a clean electricity standard. Um, just a reminder, we're sending this out as a recording tomorrow, so look forward to getting it then, and thanks for being here.